I invite you to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. You might remember, uh, I thought it might be helpful, when you're, when you're guest preaching in a church, you know, you're kind of doing something of a one-off sermon, but since I do enjoy the opportunity to come down here more regularly than perhaps other places, I thought it might be good to have something of a familiar series to you. So we began to look at the churches that are described in the book of Revelation and see what the Lord of the church has to say about these churches and begin to understand and apply the principles to the Master's Church of Bucks County. And last time we were here, we were looking at the message to the church in Ephesus. Today we're looking at the message to Smyrna. I thought, well, this is perfect because this is a church that we want to be like. This is a church that we all want our churches to be like. And since it's January 8th, and we've all given up on our individual New Year's resolutions already, so maybe then it's appropriate to reconsider a different approach to our New Year's resolutions. And it might be more no, long-lasting if we assess our New Year's resolutions from the point of view of a congregation and then instead of individuals. So maybe we can have a New Year's, resolution, New Year's resolutions for a church instead of our individual lives. Of course, obviously you understand that the nature of the church is comprised of individual bodies making one. And so you actually can't have a church that grows and a church that puts on new life in Christ continually day by day as we live to seek His glory and live for His kingdom if you're not doing that on an individual basis too. But a couple of New Year's resolutions that I looked at that I thought were kind of fun and maybe that I would adopt. One of them was may I'll make people happy or annoyed by communicating exclusively in memes for the year. <laughs> and another one was, my, lo my wife loved this one, I'll finish one of my DIY projects and abandon the rest of them. <laughs> Another one was I would go back to school to avoid paying student loans. Seems to be common theme. And I will stop drinking orange juice after brushing my teeth. <laughs> this was my favorite. I will flamingo a friend's yard in 2023. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that and I heard the Moses family volunteered. <laughs> But all jesting aside, we have New Year's resolutions. I think it's kind of unusual and, and interesting when you think about it because it, it's as though we intuitively recognize we are not who we are created to be. It's like somewhere we read that there are certain things that have been written on our hearts. And yet even as unbelievers, we recognize there's a deficiency in our lives and our consciences bear witness against those realities. It bears witness to the reality that we are guilty of something, that we are sinful, that we are in need of something, and that we are created and have been created to be worshipers of our Creator. And yet we don't do those things. And so we're always aspiring to, to put on some kind of veneer in order to better our own lives. The problem is only compounded by the thin veneer of superficial self-help gurus and motivational speakers who tell you how you can join the 5 a.m. club by convincing you of your self-worth a hundred different times, a hundred different ways over a hundred different pages. And uh, Aristotle, interestingly enough, I don't normally quote from Aristotle in case you're wondering, but even a stopped clock is right twice a day, as they say, and Aristotle was right about this. He said, um, speaking about the difference between actuality and potentiality, uh, the difference is between what is and what can be, between actuality and potentiality. And then he distinguished between the actual being, who is the real being, and the potential being as being something else. So if you followed that. But it's the opposite of what self-help gurus tell you. Self-help gurus tell you that the real you is the potential you. And the actual you is holding you back from your potential. So here are 12 secrets to becoming the best you can be. Just watch this 30 minute seminar and find out how you can unlock the secret to achieving your potential self 
and you find your potential self by buying the book or paying for the seminar at the end of the 30 minute video you watched that was supposed to reveal to you those things but no one thinks to ask well if the potential me is the real me then where did this fake me come from and if the desirable me is the real me where did this pitiful fake me come from uh, how did it get in the way but if you master everything in all the self-help books that there is to master. At best, you've accomplished some temporary achievement in your life. We get that. And it's even ironic that in seeking self-fulfillment, many times, as Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39, you actually lose your life. Um, you take the resolutions of Benjamin Franklin, for instance. Benjamin Franklin was making the long trip home to Philadelphia after his first visit to France in 1726. After the long voyage across the Atlantic, he decided to make some resolutions, he said, and to form some scheme of action that would guide his life. And he'd end up writing and rewriting his resolutions all throughout his life, but on that trip across the Atlantic, he wrote out his goal as he made his way up to the port in Philly. And he said, my goal is to apply myself industriously to whatever business I take in hand and not to divert my mind from my business by any foolish project of growing suddenly rich for industry and patience are the surest means of plenty. Now his single-mindedness and his patience are commendable attributes. Uh, even his, his understanding of the foolishness of pursuing quick reach, quick, uh, get ri quick, I can't get it out. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> get rich quick money schemes. Uh, the foolishness of pursuing that kind of stuff. I mean, the, the scriptures themselves honor hard work ethics, and they honor uh, those who, um, who labor patiently and enduringly, and it also admonishes those who would run after those quick, rich um, money schemes. But Franklin's resolutions lasted well beyond the first quarter of the year, maybe, or the first week of the year, like our resolutions tend to. But at the end of the day, Franklin's goal was extremely nearsighted. It was to arrive at plenty, to be prosperous in this life. He didn't look beyond this life. And interestingly, as he's making his way up the Delaware Bay to the docks in Philadelphia, there's another man further north in New England who's also writing resolutions. That man you know is Jonathan Edwards, and he would write some 70 resolutions that would guide his ministry for the rest of his life. He wrote those resolutions just in the first few years, the beginning of his ministry, but he was thoughtful about them. And they were very different from everything that you read by the self-help gurus. Everybody who's focused on this life, and for that matter, and he ended his resolutions differently too. There's a time that the church historian Sean Lucas said that Jonathan Edwards was not Jonathan Edwards. He was, as Aristotle said, the potential Jonathan Edwards. Uh, and that was it. He was not the theologian that we know him now to be. He was not the great pastor and missionary that we now know him to be. He was not the college president that we now know him to be. In 1722, in 1723, when he would write his resolutions, he's just 19 years old, and he is just Jonathan Edwards. For all intents and purposes, the boy, Jonathan Edwards. He hadn't preached his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That was the beginning of the end for his ministry in his home church, because they did not receive that message well. The Great Awakening and his involvement in it hadn't happened yet. The publication of religious affections or freedom of the will, not to mention his many other books and sermons and writings, enough to fill a small library, none of that had happened yet. His missionary work in Stockbridge hadn't happened yet. His presidency at Princeton University, of course, then known as the College of New Jersey, all of that was years down the road. That Jonathan Edwards, the subject of many books, dissertations, conferences, 
That had not happened yet. Jonathan Edwards was dedicating himself to certain thoughtful resolutions and by God's grace would keep them. But his goal in making and keeping those resolutions wasn't self-fulfillment or self-betterment, wasn't even really the betterment of society and the culture around him, but rather to bring glory to God. And Edwards expressed that in his very first resolution. He said, Resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to God's glory and to my own profit and pleasure in the whole of my duration. Well, what does it look then if we are going to maybe come up with some resolutions that would guide us through 2023 and, Lord willing, the rest of our lives by His grace, individually and as a church, what are some good resolutions that would bring God glory? And and as I mentioned, I think the church in Smyrna is a good example of a church to be like. And as we learn about the church in Smyrna, interestingly enough, we learn as much, if not more, about the Lord of the church than the church itself in Smyrna. Follow along with me. Revelation 2, starting verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last, who is dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. You're probably familiar with some of these churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Smyrna is one of only two that receives no criticism from the Lord of the church. Just commendation. Just encouragement. And in fact, even as one of two churches that doesn't receive any correction, it's the only one that doesn't even receive some kind of verbal command. This is the shortest letter to be read before the churches And all we find for this church, there's not much, it's just a couple words of gentle comfort. It's the shortest letter. What is apparent is that they loved their Lord greatly. And because they loved their Lord greatly, they were experiencing tremendous suffering for it. By the time Revelation is written, Timothy, Paul's son in the faith, he'd have been already martyred in the streets. Now, he wasn't martyred in Smyrna. He was martyred in a neighboring city, in the city of Ephesus, just a little bit to the south. He was persecuted in Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus was persecuted, even from its earliest days, by the hands of a few coppersmiths who engineered a mob designed to imprison and kill the Apostle Paul, based on a bunch of trumped-up charges against him, bearing false witness against him. And Smyrna was similar. Ephesus was the top of the world. It was the trade capital, the eastern trade capital of the Roman Empire. And what's funny about being sort of the top industrial city in any any part of the world, is that the only place to go from there is down. And Smyrna was fast competing to take that number one position. And they were largely successful. There were some geographic things that were changing in Ephesus port at the time, and that was threatening its whole economy. Sediment was beginning to fill up the bay, and so their trade was um, being threatened by the inability of ships to enter into their harbor. Now, today, Ephesus is six miles inland from all of that sediment filling the harbor. And so they were finding new trade 
in economy and in, in um, really the hospitality industry, you might say. Thousands of people would come as tourists to visit the Temple Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And Smyrna wasn't satisfied to simply take away its economic trade epicenter in Ephesus, but it also sought to trump the city of Ephesus in its tourism too. And they had at least a dozen different, um, different temples that people would come to visit as well. Today we know the city as Izmir, which is a Turkish rendering, the same name, Smyrna. And in Smyrna, Christians threatened the tourist industry, just as they did in Ephesus. Same reason that Paul was persecuted. As people got saved, threatens the economy because now people aren't buying idols anymore. Same thing happens in Smyrna, and they're not happy. To this day, Christians have been all but annihilated from the city. Just a small, tiny remnant of faithful believers there. And just as in the first century, they're persecuted. And maybe that's why, and maybe there's an inherent lesson in this too, but maybe that's why for a persecuted church, we learn more about the Lord of the church than the persecuted church itself. There are three comforting characteristics of the Lord of the church in Revelation 2, 8 to 11. And at the same time that we look at this, if you, if you think of maybe our outline as, as two transparencies, where we have three descriptions of the Lord of the church that provides comfort and confidence for the church in Smyrna, we can look at three descriptions of that church. Because as they look to their Lord, who is faithful, they in response acted in faith, in fortitude, and maybe we could say finality. They finished the work that they were called to. All because of who the Lord is. And first, the first thing that kind of gets our attention really comes at the second half of verse 8 and verse 9. He is the first and the last. And then verse 9 begins, I know. I know your tribulation, and your poverty. So now, you, you might have noticed, and this isn't any kind of uh, clever illustration or whatever else on my part, um, alliteration or what have you, but I said that the Lord of the church is the Lord who knows. I could have said omniscient, right? Our Lord is omniscient. He knows everything. But I didn't. I didn't say He is omniscient by design. Omniscient means that He is all-knowing. He knows everything. But the kind of knowledge that Christ is presented as having here goes beyond knowledge in the sense of intellectual knowledge. Maybe remembering that Jesus is omniscient helps you a little bit when you're suffering. Knowing that Jesus knows you are suffering, it does offer a little bit of help. You know that He knows you exist and that your suffering is real, but it isn't merely intellectually know about your suffering. This is a compassionate and sympathetic kind of knowledge, an experiential one you might say. And not only that, but his experiential knowledge of this church's suffering even transcends their own experiential knowledge of their suffering. In other words, he has experienced and knows more about their suffering than they do. But he isn't saying that diminutively to belittle their suffering. You know, we do that all the time. We're always trying to one-up 
one of the other's pain and suffering as if that's supposed to help. Little kids will do that all the time. Maybe a child falls off their bike and scuffs one of their hands up when they break their fall, begins to cry, and an older sibling unsympathetically walks up to them and says, you shouldn't be crying. One time I fell off my bike and I scraped both my hands and my knees. Now, well, how does the younger sibling respond to that? Oh. <laughs> I was mistaken. I guess this doesn't really hurt after all, so I'm so glad you shared that with me and that helped me cope with my pain. <laughs> now, this isn't that. This isn't a knowledge that's diminutive of the church in Smyrna's suffering. Hey, listen, I know the kind of suffering that you're going to, but <laughs> remember, it has nothing to, you can't hold a candle to the suffering that I endured on the cross. Not just the fleshly suffering on the cross, but the pain of my God, my Father, turning His back against me, His Son, because I was bearing your guilt. And knowing that it gave Him pleasure, because by bearing your guilt, you bore my righteousness. So you want to talk about suffering, Smyrna? <laughs> Just think about what you could be going through if I hadn't done that. That's not the kind of compassion. That's not compassionate. But that's not the kind of knowledge that Christ is sharing with the church in Smyrna. This is that of a loving parent who embraces a child in love. A child crying because of their pain. A loving parent doesn't take up their child and belittle their child's suffering or their child's problems. You think this hurts? You don't know anything. Let me, let me give you the laundry list of all the suffering that I've endured over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Now, a loving parent just scoops the child up, embraces them, consoles them. And all the child wants to know, and what's sufficient for them, is for that little child to know that their parents know this hurts. <laughs> That's why you have that funny band-aid effect. The child doesn't have an actively being cut, but maybe they got a bruise of some kind, and the parent might say, do you want a band-aid? Yes. And they put a band-aid on, and the parent knows this has nothing to do with the actual nature of the, in the injury, but the child feels better. They don't know why they feel better, but they feel better because they have an acknowledgement, a loving acknowledgement of their pain from their parents. And we don't even think about that usually. We just say, I know. I know. It hurts, doesn't it? And that's satisfactory. The child rejoices to hear that. They're comforting words because we're not lording over them in our knowledge. But what happens if a child is hurt and you know that the child will hurt more before their pain is better? Maybe they broke their arm and you know that that arm needs to be set. And it's going to be more painful before things get better. Then you might say, I know. It'll be over soon. Something of that effect. But what does the Lord do? He's infinitely sovereign, infinitely wise, infinitely knowing of all things, the perfect counselor, perfect comforter. He knows that this church in Smyrna, a church that we want to be like, they're experiencing tremendous suffering and will have to endure more of it, more suffering for His name's sake before it gets better. What does He say to them? Well, that's the second half of verse 8. He says, I am the first and the last who is dead and has come to life. How does that help? Well, that was a specific Old Testament title that came from the prophet Isaiah. He says, I am the first and the last. Isaiah used that specifically for the God of Israel three times. The first is in Isaiah 41, and he uses it in the context of his sovereignty over the nations of the earth. Verse 2 says that he makes them like dust, 
with the sword. These, these nations that God was using to punish Israel, and yet at the same time, God will not let them go without proper punishment too. And then in chapter 44, Isaiah uses it with the promise of the Holy Spirit who will prov provide for their need and, and admonishment not to fear. Do not fear. There's a faithful remnant in Israel and God will not allow them to be annihilated. He will preserve a remnant for them. And then in chapter 48, the name is used again in conjunction with God's sovereign decree. The things that God decreed from long ago before the foundations of the earth. And verse 4 says that he knew that Israel itself, his own people, would be stubborn and they would be obstinate, their neck as an iron sinew, and their forehead bronze. Verse 8 says they were rebels at birth. And yet as sure as the Lord is, Isaiah says, who is the first and also the last he will preserve His people and carry out justice against Babylon for what they do, though God decreed it. It's incredible. And it's right in line with the affirmation of God's sovereignty back in Revelation chapter 2. gives great comfort to the church in Smyrna. God decrees their suffering. Tremendous suffering. And He knows their suffering. But God will use that suffering even to preserve them. And we can understand what Christ's death and victory over death would mean to the church. If he experienced death and rose triumphant over it, then so would these precious people who are about to become martyrs. This is a direct result of their faithfulness. They're poor. I mean, they're dirt poor. They're absolutely destitute. Worse than death, maybe for these people, was living. Now, Smyrna itself, I already indicated, it's a tremendously wealthy city. This is the place that you want to be. But the Christians lost everything. Now, Smyrna was an extremely loyal city to Rome. In fact, not only did it have multiple temples, it even invented a new goddess out of its allegiance to Rome called Roma. And it even won a competition for the right to build a temporary a temple to the emperor Tiberius in AD 26. And so it is a dedicated city to the Roman pantheon, as well as to the Greek gods, and to the imperial cult, which permeated every aspect of life. And every male citizen, then, had to offer this incense to a statue of the emperor, and in exchange for that, you got this nice little certificate that allowed you to buy or sell. So, with this certificate, you could do essential business, you might say, but you needed to have it. Without it, your merchandise would be confiscated, no one could sell you anything, and you couldn't buy anything. Your possessions would be confiscated, everything would be taken from you because you were a nonconformist. Interestingly, Aristotle also distinguished between good citizenry and being a good citizen. A good citizen might make you like a German in Nazi Germany and comply with everything that the Nazi state told you to do. That's a good citizen, but that's not good citizenry. Good citizenry would actually resist and promote righteousness. A Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you might say. But you're not a good citizen. You're a nonconformist. You're not complying. You're not participating in the imperial cult. And so, by poverty, the 
the consequence of refusing to comply didn't result in a poverty, even like that we see in America, where you can find a soup kitchen somewhere. You're not going to starve to death in the States. This is no so-called lower middle class where you can apply and get an Obama phone and you get your internet taken care of at home and you can even subscribe to meals and take those to grocery stores and have all those things taken care of. When I used to work in a rescue mission, one of the greatest frustrations was that a guy would get saved and understanding that he has now familial responsibilities and he also has been called by God to work. And he would go, but Matt, you know, <laughs> if I work with my background, my criminal history, I, best case scenario, I'm making minimum wage, maybe even $10 an hour or something. But I can make three times that off of the government by not working. And then I can support my family. So here's a moral dilemma. Do I go to work, jeopardize all that, and now I can't support my family? Or do I not work and continue to live off of the government? So this is not anything like these dilemmas that we experience among the lower middle class in America. This is tokea. This is extremely poor, like a beggar. You had absolutely no means, crushing poverty. You couldn't make the basic necessities of life. Your stomach is inflated because of starvation. It's absolutely devastating. And this sweet little church isn't poor because of their criminal history. This sweet little church isn't poor because they're intellectually inferior people or lacked ingenuity or maybe a hard work ethic or whatever. This poverty was by choice. And not a vow of poverty either, which would be a concept that would become perverted over the course of church history as well. Distorted. Their poverty is an indirect decision. They were determined to be faithful, and their faithfulness meant poverty because they wouldn't light this cheap little candlestick and pay homage to the bust of a Roman Empire, of a Roman Emperor. Because the first thing that describes this church is faithfulness. Now, only men, the head of each family, the husband, the father, had a had to do this, burn this incense to the emperor, and then he could get that little certificate, and he could go to work, and he could supply for his own and his family's needs. So imagine, then, because of your faithfulness, to a faithful Lord, you don't burn this incense, you lose your job, your business is confiscated from you, and you're starving. No one can show legally generosity or goodwill to you, by the way. You're not allowed to take handouts, but you also have no means. And so because of your faithfulness, you watch as your wife and children starve. And every night you tuck your kids to bed, and they're whimpering. And you hear them whimpering, even in their sleep throughout the night, because their stomachs inflamed from starvation. They're starving to death. Even before they would become martyrs, just like you. They're whimpering in hunger. All because... All because you just don't burn a candle. I'm not sure that the church can be described by that kind of faithfulness today. I'm not sure that we've got men committed to that kind of leadership in the home today, let alone in the church. There are some of them. Certainly doesn't characterize 21st century Christianity, does it? That's more interested in these flash church growth methods than being anchored and well-rooted in truth. I'm not sure that we've got women committed to that kind of strength and faithfulness either. And, and you, you see that because they certainly don't rejoice when there is a husband with that kind of courage and conviction. Maybe you remember going a couple years back 
the name Andrew Brunson. He made international headlines a couple of years ago, um, especially his wife as she was petitioning the U.S. government to help her husband. He had three children as well, and he was an American pastor in Izmir, the same city, in Smyrna. For 23 years he labored there to a congregation of 25 people in poverty. A city of nearly 3 million when in 2016 he was arrested by the Turkish government and imprisoned with 20 people in a prison cell designed for eight. He's charged with espionage and terrorism and during his court hearing the judge dismissed all of his defense witnesses without listening to their testimonies. And the prosecution used secret witnesses who testified through video monitors that distorted their images and voices to protect their anonymity. It sounds a lot like this the second description of Smyrna's tribulation that they endured, the slander and blasphemy in verse 9. And that's perhaps even harder to bear than poverty. But when Brunson was released by the Trump administration who put economic sanctions on Turkey until they let him go, Brunson told the American church, I don't think that we're prepared for what's coming. Referring to persecution, referring to suffering. He says, I fear that many of us are complacent and we're unaware that the people in our churches are going to be blindsided by what comes. And then he looked to the deficit of leadership in the church and the home as the problem. Less than a year later, COVID comes. And we saw in church after church in America how spineless our churches really are. They could not and were not willing to stand up against tyrannical edicts around the world and encourage the body of Christ and gather together, worship our Savior. We are far more concerned with how the world is going to react to us. What they were going to say, what they were going to accuse us of, and Many even would write about how all of, that is, all of that is loving ultimately to the world, to comply to their fear. And the world just ha hated churches that wouldn't conform to the fear. They accused us of all kinds of things. You could be sure that they would have gladly killed you if they had the opportunity. If it went long enough, they surely would have. They didn't, only because public sentiment was still too favorable to church. It was a little bit too close to home. I mean, we only dealt with COVID, what? I mean, I guess two years. But it was really hot for a couple of weeks. A couple of months, even, when the world was criticizing churches for continuing to gather together in fellowship. But the slander that we endured was, just in a small measure, the kind of slander that the church in Smyrna dealt with. And, and that tells us, to, to endure that kind of slander, that this is a church that's faithful, but it is also a church with fortitude. That deficient quality that has been demonstrated again and again in the American church. Just men with spineless convictions. And we're not talking about, when we read about that, they, they are being blasphemed, they're being accused. This isn't talking about hurting someone's character or even the kind of slander that, that might prevent you from being promoted in a job. This is the kind of slander that results in imprisonment and death. That's the third kind of tribulation that these Christians experienced. The Jews were exempt from all of this. They were exempt from having to, to offer this candle, this incense to the imperial cult. About a century earlier, Jerusalem had supported Julius Caesar during the Civil War, so they were granted a special pardon. They could worship their God and pray to Him on behalf of the emperor instead of worship the emperor directly. 
They allowed him to do that. But the Jews made sure that the Romans knew that the Christians were not a part of that. Neither were they, interestingly enough. But this is kind of the first, I guess, instance of social justice that we see. Because by the principle of them being related to those Jews who helped Rome, they were therefore worthy of being exempt from the edict. But the Christians, they weren't. Neither one of them actually helped anybody. But nevertheless, the the Jews made sure that the Romans knew that they should not be granted the same leniency that they had. They made sure that Rome knew that Christians should be required to pay homage or suffer the penalty of death. And it was deceitful, it was malicious, because they knew that the Christians wouldn't. And the Jews were in the best position to know who the Christians were as well, because where did the early church meet? They met in synagogues. Primarily, they met in synagogues. So the Jews know who the Christians are. They know their theology pretty well, too. So they know how to misrepresent and slander and twist and distort in order to bring up these false charges and accumulate these accusations against them that they would take to the courts. How do you think that the Romans learned about communion, for instance, that the Jews said was cannibalism. Or maybe the idea of brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ, because we are all the body and family of Christ, that the Jews manipulated by design and convinced the Romans that the Christians were all participating in incest and therefore worthy of death. They're marrying their sisters. Not only that, but the Jews said that they were politically disloyal and fire raisers, insurrectionists, because they said the world would end in fire. The Jews know that all that was slander? Of course they did. I think it's good for us to remember that the world is under a demonically inspired hate for the church. Reminded of it in the second half of verse 9. They're of the synagogue of Satan. That's who they belong to. That's who they worship. And so in Smyrna, they're finally arrested, imprisoned, and killed in verse 10. Political insurrection was a capital offense. And imprisonment in those days was just a gatekeeper for death. The proper punishment. Ten days at the most for a capital offense. That's why verse 10 says... That they aren't to fear what they're about to suffer. The devil is about to cast them into prison so you'll be tested and you'll have tribulation for ten days. That's why the tribulation is ten days. That was the most you could be imprisoned for a capital offense. Then they'd be killed. Historians tell us that so many Christians suffered death in those days that they had great difficulty with the lions. Because the lions were full. They had eaten too many Christians. So they were no longer interested in mauling them. They were lazy. You had to keep them starved if you wanted a good show in the arena. But they fed off of too many believers. So then they just began to cut them down. And then a new problem arose. And that they couldn't manufacture enough swords for the Roman soldiers. Because you could only resharpen those swords so many times after slaying so many people. And they killed so many Christians that their swords grew dull and then were useless after being resharpened so many times. And in spite of all that, the Lord of the church says, You are rich. There's not a lot of charlatans and imposters where a persecuted church is involved. As far as the church goes and its doctrine, they're not really interested in sugar-coated, lightweight stuff when there's a high cost to pay for following Christ. And He knows that. So He offers them tremendous comfort. 
But not only is his knowledge a, a comfort, there's a tremendous comfort in knowing that all of this is in accordance with the decree of God in his infinite wisdom. The tribulation of the church here is within his control. And so the second attribute that we are reminded of about the Lord of the church, is, I've already indicated it, is that He is sovereign. Now, yes, the church, and we can expect that the church in America is going to be increasingly persecuted over time. The, the world is increasingly antagonistic towards us. And though when I went into ministry, I, I believe that there was a possibility. It was certainly plausible. I understood the anomaly of the American experience in, in, in history. And I understood that it, it wouldn't be improbable that by the, court, the end of my life, looking at the trajectory of the, of the nations and so forth, that it might be that I'm arrested by the time the Lord calls me home. Arrested for my faith. Now, at this point... I would be surprised if it doesn't happen. We all watched our friends get arrested because of their faithfulness in places like Canada and the threats to be arrested and fined and our churches being closed and the concerns of bringing our house down on our own family's heads because of our faithfulness. We, we saw that, but even, even still, we're not dealing with the persecution. Maybe that's true that the church in Smyrna dealt with, but certainly we want to model their faithfulness. And we can model their faithfulness because God is a God who knows and God is a God who is sovereign. And because He knows, the church is encouraged in its faith and its fortitude. But God is sovereign. That's the second lesson of comfort for the church in Smyrna. If we're not paying close attention, we could miss it. Not because it's in any way veiled, but because it's so obvious, we might overlook it. It's hiding in plain sight, you might say, in verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. You realize that you can't issue that kind of command unless you have a measure of control. Otherwise, it's just cheap sentimentality. But even more than this poor church's circumstances, the next clause in verse 10 seems to directly assault and threaten God's control. The devil is about to cast some of you into prison. He says, Behold. It's a word that's supposed to get your attention. Behold what the devil is about to do. The word means... To the effect, look, look at my eyes, listen to me. And you, you might understand a parent, maybe a, a child is starting to hyperventilate because of how they've reacted to the scuffed hand. And, and now they're, they're, in a sense, they're, they're almost out of control. They're afraid and their fear is, is making the situation work. And now a parent it might be consoling them and saying, listen, I know, I understand, I know, I know. And they're consoling the child. But now they must get the child's attention and say, look, look at my eyes. Look at my eyes. It will be okay. But a parent can't say that unless it's going to be true, can they? And if there are circumstances that appear to be outside of their control, they must be in control in order to give the child the confidence that it will be okay or they will undermine their parental authority in the future. God says, look. Look at my eyes. Listen. See. Behold. The devil, the very one, who is worshipped in the synagogue by the ones who betrayed you is about to cast you into prison. And if not for the little purpose clause that immediately follows, we might even be tempted to question the headship of Christ over the church. Because without it, we read, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison and you'll have tribulation for ten days. Then you'll die. Be faithful until death. Why? Why be faithful until death unless God is con in control of what Satan is doing? What security is there in that? How can we be sure that there will be victory in the end? 
how do we know that our hope isn't in vain? God reminds us that even though He is not the author of sin, He's not the author of evil, and although He doesn't tempt us with evil, He is sovereign over it, and He'll use it to accomplish His purpose, not Satan's purpose. Satan, yes, will cast them into prison. Yes, Satan will kill them, and He'll use His worshipers to kill them. But Satan, in doing so, is not accomplishing his purpose. He's accomplishing God's. You remember the account of Job. The same thing happens. Satan is granted the authority to inflict Job and even take lives. But he doesn't accomplish his purpose. What's Satan's purpose in Job? Satan's purpose is to get Job, the faithful servant, to blaspheme God. Does he accomplish his purpose in inflicting suffering? Or does Satan accomplish God's purpose, who sought to proclaim to the heavens Job's faithfulness? Well, this church's suffering bears witness to the exact same thing. Satan is never able to use evil to accomplish his own purpose. Where Satan intends to use evil to destroy, God uses evil and suffering to purge and purify His people. You remember what Jesus told Simon Peter in Luke chapter 22. This is before Peter betrays him in the garden. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. Well, that's great. You told him to get lost, right? Jesus says that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. No, he doesn't tell Satan to get lost. He prays that Peter would be faithful and strengthened, and then being strengthened, he would be a discipler in fortitude to strengthen the church, his brothers. Simon will grow in his faith, he'll grow in fortitude, and God will use even Peter's cowardice to strengthen his faith. And so He truly does work all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And we might be wondering, though, we can see, okay, Peter, he's got some deficiencies. He needs to be strengthened. He needs to be taught to be faithful. He needs a spine. And he also needs to maybe control his temper a little bit. But the church in Smyrna? Why did the church in Smyrna need to be tested? They, they're honored and commended. No words of criticism here. We've got nothing on them. It's a lovely, lovely little church. So why are they so severely tested? I mean, why not let one of the other five unfaithful churches have it. A.W. Pink said, When you observe that the fire in your room is going down, you don't just put on more coals. You need the stoker to stir the fire. God often uses the black stoker of adversity in order that the flame of devotion may bring more blessing. So, you mean God, in His sovereignty, I bring poverty in order to bring blessing? You mean that God might bring tribulation in order to bring blessing? Even when that blessing isn't realized in this world? Of course. And what a privilege to be used like Smyrna to bring God glory and to prove His sovereignty or of all the forces of darkness. And not only that, but their faithfulness to Him ultimately re reveals His faithfulness to them. And that's the last description of the Lord of the church in Revelation 2, verses 10 to 11. We started with a faithful church, but now we see that it is the Lord Himself who is faithful in the end. And the implication in these verses as well, 
But this is a faithful church with fortitude that finishes. Because God is a God who knows who is sovereign and who is Himself faithful. Be faithful till death, and I'll give you the crown of life. He who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So this is what Jesus said in, in John chapter 6. You might remember this in verse 39. This is the will of Him who sent me that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. In John 10, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So Christ promises to keep those who belong to Him, which means that your faithfulness, even in the worst of suffering, especially if it is suffering because you bear the name of Christ, you're not so much demonstrating your faithfulness to Christ as you're demonstrating His faithfulness to you. Faith is given to you as God's gift for salvation, and faith was given to you as God's gift for endurance. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, To keep me from exalting myself, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, and He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And so I'm content with my weaknesses with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because we're increasingly autonomous or increasingly dependent on the Lord's grace. And which brings glory to Him. And genuine saving faith will always result in eternal life. The victor's crown, the, the crown of life as it's put in Revelation 2.10. That's why James said in James 1, in verse 12, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life that the Lord had promised to all those who love him. You know, after suffering tremendously at the Ravensbrück concentration camp during the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands, Corrie ten Boom commented, If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. Because God is a God who knows. He's a God who's sovereign. And He's a God who is faithful. And because of the nature of who He is, we can have faith, fortitude and finish well. John's writing these words. I want you to put yourself in this ancient city in Smyrna. A populous city, a booming city, a busy city. A city full of tourists, entrepreneurs, all of the rest. And you're sitting in a congregation. And with you is a man, a young man, He's 29. He happens to be the pastor. Don't know if he's the man who is the messenger who is reading this letter to the church. It might be because he's the pastor, but he might be the pastor and has had somebody else read it so that he can simply be with the congregation and hear the word of the Lord. What is the Lord of the church saying to us under the severe persecution? You look at your shoulder to see how the pastor is responding. This young 29-year-old man, his name is Polycarp. And he was the pastor in Smyrna at the time that they would have received this letter. You want to know how does your pastor respond to this? What you don't know, that 60 years later, 
Polycarp would show the world what faithfulness to a faithful God looks like. Become one of the most well-known martyrs from church history, burned and stabbed to death at the age of 87. He'd have been 27, 28, 29 when he first got this letter to the church. Told him he was going to die. Could have run, but he doesn't run. He stays and faithfully shepherds God's people. And Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. John himself ordained Polycarp as the minister in this church. Polycarp would have been there when he hears this letter read. And with verse 10, do not fear, emblazoned into his mind, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Polycarp hears that the Roman authorities are coming to arrest him. He's been in hiding. They haven't been able to do that. But they tortured a little girl to find his whereabouts. That was the extent of hate. They would torture an innocent little girl to find out where he is. And he's marched into the arena before some 10,000 people where he's put on trial, where he's persistently urged for hours to renounce Christ. And that's incredible. That's all he had to do. Just renounce Christ. But he wouldn't do that. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Whoever denies me before men, I'll also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And only a few verses before that, Jesus said, Don't fear those who kill the body, but can't kill the soul. Fear Him who can cast both soul and body into hell. It's far worse than any physical suffering the world can cause. Lest we believe that the way to salvation is through suffering and martyrdom, Jesus makes it clear that this is merely the result of someone who genuinely loves Him. He who loves father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me, and he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. In other words, Jesus is saying that my true followers love me, and they love me so dearly that denying me is far more fearful to them than the fear of death. So Polycarp says, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he's done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my King and Savior? You threaten me with a fire that lasts but a little while, and after a little while it's quenched, but you are ignorant of the everlasting fire that is prepared for the wicked. But why do you delay? Come and do what you will. Losing his patience, the proconsul shouted, Recant your atheism, which is what they accused the Christians of. They were the original atheists because they rejected the Greek and Roman pantheon. And so Polycarp turns to the masses and cries, Recant your atheism, because they denied the true God. And at that, Polycarp is burned. And since they had difficulty with the fire that day, kept blowing in the wind. He was stabbed to death and he received his crown of righteousness. Some 60 years he was faithful to his Lord. Can we not simply, as a church, maybe resolve to be faithful with fortitude until we finish? Maybe that's a good start to the year. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are so encouraged always, Lord, to hear of those faithful saints who are just like us, who've been given life by You, and who just simply love You and gather together to worship You. Proclaim Your name, the way of salvation to the nations, just like us. And yet, in your wisdom, in your sovereignty, you have ordinarily called your church to suffer greatly for being faithful to you. And we are encouraged by it. 
not because we're interested in the gore and sort of a sentimental satisfaction and seeing these people who held to their convictions but because we know ultimately that you were faithful to them they didn't die in vain they had courage and we can have courage by your grace too we know it's all your work we're dependent completely on you and father we're thankful for the work that you have done and continue to do in us pray that our resolution for the remainder of our days and for this church that be we glorify you amen